I think everybody's in that's going to be here for the opening here. And uh, I'm Chris Deering. I'm chairman of the festival. Um, welcome all to our new venue at the Edinburgh Interac Interactive, the, the biggest little games event of the calendar. Um, most people come tend to come back and enjoy uh, the different way we do things. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about this new venue. Uh, we're able to use this film house, which is sort of the equivalent of BAFTA in London, here in Edinburgh, uh, because the film festival moved to a new date. They had a bit of trouble overlapping with the uh, overall giant uh, fringe festival, etc. So uh, they moved and we have the opportunity to be here. And it's a great place because we'll be able to do the screenings in this uh, same room uh, and have all our events in the same place so people don't get confused and a nice space for coffee and chat downstairs. And later today from six to nine, uh, uh, a cocktail party networking event out in Festival Square, which is right next door, and you'll immediately recognize the big juggernaut there from uh, Sony and the uh, play space from Nintendo, who are, again, thank you, uh, thankfully, our sponsors this year. I'd like to thank all the sponsors who were mentioned along the bottom of the screen, MCV, Develop, um, and, uh, of course, Sony and Nintendo. We're Overlapping also this year in date a little differently from the middle of the month before Gamescom to uh, now at the end of the month so that we can dovetail with the television festival. And more and more uh, our, uh, our lives with the TV world are starting to overlap and we think it's good to have some fruitful discussions about how that could be done in a more productive, interesting and fun way. I'd like to uh, thank Barrington Harvey and Alexa Turnus and her team uh, who helped put together all the details of the uh, event and especially our content committee, um, which includes uh, Wendy Rosenthal and Sean Drumgoul, who will be up here a little later, uh, Matt Rothman, Kieran O'Neill, Peter Cowley, and Fred Hassan. Um, it takes quite a bit of work to get something like this uh, planned over the year and all of the people that work on this other than the event people are totally volunteers. Uh, and it, it's fun, but it's a lot of work and uh, they deserve to be recognized for that uh, contribution. So today I'll start with a quick sort of helicopter view of what I see are the uh, emerging issues now in the industry. And then we'll have uh, a very nice presentation from Ray McGuire of Sony on 3D and the emerging trends there. Uh, we have then uh, Sean Dramgul, who's going to take us through some pretty interesting new information about usage, attitude, and awareness, and a coffee break, after which Paul Hayden will talk about disruptive uh, forces in the economics of the game space. We always have someone talking about the business of games even though this isn't officially a business uh, conference. Uh, we have Igor Pesencek, who's going to uh, present uh, his story, a very interesting game that's come from nowhere and catapulted into a giant uh, usage uh, with some quite simple but very, very compelling gameplay, which is all constantly updated and sells for around a dollar or a pound <coughs> per time. <clears throat> but uh, adds up pretty quickly, and uh, that'll give some of us food for thought. Uh, and finally, we end the day today with uh, a debate that uh, questions what the role of uh, the publisher is in our field. And I'm not going to get too much more into that, but we have some interesting points of view. And that will be hosted by Ian Livingston, who is uh, here from uh, Square Enix. And then this afternoon after the debate, the uh, screenings commence. Uh, and we're going to have some interesting display of uh, new technology on Connect from Microsoft. And uh, a nice showreel from Codemasters and a very good presentation on music engines for enhancing the 
emotion in games of how the music is handled, um, and some others as well. So that takes us through today and tonight. Uh, you can see the exit signs, please shut off your mobiles. Uh, the uh, place for coffee is downstairs, you've already been there. And the place for the drinks is next door at Festival Square. We have a full day tomorrow, but I won't get into all of that. You'll forget it anyway. So without further ado, let me start with my presentation. And if this works. OK, we're in recession. Everybody knows it. Life goes on. Recessions used to be good for our industry, but uh, why not this time? <coughs> What's different? People are still looking for value. That's pretty common in a recession. People are staying home to save money. That should be good for games. The TV is there, as always. Uh, there's a bit less drama. They have their production cost issues, too. A lot more reality TV, but uh, there's good stuff there. Um, but not enough to prevent interest in gaming. The games are more engaging and a good choice for passing time. But so is video over the internet, and uh, that's one of the new developing uh, phenomena. We've got 500 million people on the internet around the world. Within maybe another five years, there'll be three times that. And 80% of the people who are connected to the internet are watching video on it. In fact, there was a Pew Research study that just came out three days ago in the US that said uh, for people under 30, uh, less than one out of three regard a television set or a landline phone as being essential to their lives. Mm -hmm. That's pretty uh, astounding, frankly, because people under 30 in a few more years will be, you know, the main, the main thing. And uh, it's important to understand that. And I think we all kind of feel that, but like in, in the UK, 17% of men don't watch TV on TVs anymore. They watch all their TV on their laptops or maybe now iPads, if uh, they can get it on that. So anyway, <clears throat> what's different this time? It's all about the internet. Uh, <clears throat> the internet makes life dynamic, exciting, personalized with rich media uh, on many screens, and trial is almost always free. This is pretty exciting. Uh, people used to buy games in the recession because it was a low cost per hour entertainment form. And it still is, but there are other things that are even lower cost uh, when you think about the variety that's available, especially on the social sites. Facebook, you know, five-year-old phenomenon, in the same time it took Google to become a monster, Facebook is a monster with 500 million people registered and an unbelievable number of people playing games on it. Well, last year we had Christian Segerstrahler from Playfish in about three weeks after the event, well, not necessarily cause and effect, but uh, his company was acquired uh, by Electronic Arts. Uh, cost per hour is even less with casual games, as everyone knows, and on mobile phones. And the bandwidth that facilitated music file sharing is now a factor in games as well, and it won't get any less. So the new, re new reality is that the economics of traditional high-end games are quite treacherous. Um, in 2008, there were 45 games in the U.S. that sold over a million units. In 2009, there was only 32. If you want to make a new game now, or let's say a classic, big, a bigger-than-life game, Call of Duty style, you're talking 20, 30, 40 million dollars. You, you don't, if you can't do a million units in the U.S. Uh, on a new game, you're doomed and the number of games that fit through the eye of that needle is shrinking. So we have to think about how this all uh, sorts itself out. The industry has been through many, many uh, traumas and disruptions and evolutionary uh, phenomena and always survived and come out stronger. Uh, there's a lot of good things about what's going on, but the economics are treacherous. And uh, for all the people employed, in making games and all the people employed in publishing games and all of the 
end users that love to play games, uh, these great games are not going to be available. There's a wide variety unless something is done about that imbalance. So it sounds to me like it's time to get non-traditional, or at least figure out what makes a non-traditional world tick. Um, what is the new world that we must build in to our thinking? Well, virtual, uh, first of all, MMOs and virtual worlds, much, much bigger than five years ago. A lot of time spent on them, a lot of opportunities for creativity. Not all of them spectacular uh, programming phenomena. Uh, Pre-owned games, fact of life. We had rental of DVDs and VHS cassettes, and we've had rental of games, and I think pre-owned games are kind of a surrogate for rental, which may not be totally bad, but in the aggregate, they certainly felt to be a horrible problem for the economics of the industry, the creative side of the industry. Uh, Performance-based games, uh, thanks to uh, freeing people from the keyboard and the joypad, uh, the great uh, early days, I guess maybe light guns were there all along, steering wheels, but uh, you know, we had iToy and SingStar and then Nintendo came along and made a whole platform based on this uh, emancipation and literally doubled the number of people playing uh, console games and outsold the other two consoles combined for a long time. Um, so this is part of the, the landscape and we have to recognize it and use it positively. User enhanced games, uh, well UGC is certainly a big factor. Uh, it's a component in uh, Guitar Hero, Rock Band and SingStar. Um, but there are new types. We had last year a very nice display of Little Big Planet where people get involved in actually creating levels. There will probably be more of this. We have a presentation tomorrow about how that might be done in the music industry to bring rational profitability back or help bring it back. Uh, games inside Facebook. I just mentioned that. Uh, Farmville. The kind of numbers of people playing Farmville just dwarf the great successes of uh, us console makers of the 90s when we used to get really excited about after five years having 40 million installed base around Europe uh, and, and you've got a company where uh, a game where more than 25 million people are playing every day that just wasn't around more than a year ago so this is gigantic seismic impact have to harness it somehow um, where's the silver lining? And there is a silver lining. Everybody's playing something. Uh, I guess the only thing that probably wasn't counted into the industry that we uh, quantified in the old days, so to speak, was the number of women over 30 playing solitaire on the desktop of a computer, which was the ultimate uh, free casual game. Now there's thousands of different varieties downloaded or already on the desktop, so you know that's part of it, but certainly the number of people playing games is 80% almost of uh, most big country population. So they're familiar with it, they're excited by it, they get into them, and they do pay uh, quite often for something that gets them excited. So that's a good sign, that's a silver lining. <coughs> Digital distribution. If you want something, you can get it as fast as we learn about it. Uh, and removing a lot of the inventory risk and the shelf space problem that has been a 